This is a title in praise of the American political process. America began as colonies that sought to freely live their religious beliefs. It was precisely this Judeo-Christian worldview and its beliefs and values that defined our notions of liberty and justice for all. Our national independence was born out of the labor pains inflicted by the tyranny of a monarch and an aristocracy, the dictatorial elite, that violated these beliefs and values. These beliefs shaped and fueled this greatest of all of government experiments, of which its centerpiece was a new process of government, a uniquely American political process. Our founding fathers, mindful of human foibles and that absolute power tends to, act, to corrupt absolutely, therefore established a new government, not under the old monarchy, but under a constitution that provided checks and balances to curb the power of government, especially a central government. The states were given primacy, and thus the United States is a republic of states. At both levels were established a legislature to enact laws, an executive branch to implement those laws, and a judiciary to interpret those laws and their implementation to ensure neither violated the Constitution. We therefore have a political structure and process in place that is geared toward equity, not efficiency. Always beware of a politician that promises greater efficiency because a dictatorship is extremely efficient. A limited government with constitutional guarantees ensures, for now, freedom of religion freedom of speech and assembly, a free press, the right to bear arms, freedom from the unjust seizure of property, and the right to vote. The fundamental truths our Constitution recognizes as a basis for these freedoms are the inalienable rights possessed by every human being. These rights are inalienable precisely because of their source. They derive not from an elite that declares them to be correct, nor from the consensus of the majority, nor because, excuse me, but because they derive from the absolute above and from whom there is no appeal, divine providence, almighty God. The United States is the greatest nation on earth. Why? Not because of her military or that she could take over the world, but has it. Not because she produces the most food or that she has always assisted in every international disaster of the most hate of any country. Not because she's given her people the greatest prosperity in the world, and certainly not because of her so-called entertainment or the export food. But we are great because of our values, our ideas, our political process, and our commitment to freedom. We lose these, and we lose our greatness. Of freedom, Pope Paul, Pope John Paul II said, Freedom follows the responsibility to do right. Sounds good. So what is right? Questions of right and wrong, of morality, of justice, were once no-brainers in our culture. There was clear unanimity on these questions at the beginnings of our nation. There was common ground at the beginning of our nation, but no longer. Allow me to illustrate this point with the story. As a uh, lobbyist for more than 20 years in California, I had a unique visitor one day. I'll call him Pavel. After the fall of communism, Eastern Europeans in the early 1990s were hungry to learn the ropes of American democracy, and so they came to that cradle of freedom in the United States. Our Senate Office of Protocol arranged an interview for a writer from Prague, Czechoslovakia, to meet a lobbyist to discuss private input to the political process. I was that lobbyist selected to meet Pavel and to talk with him about our government and our freedoms. Our meeting lasted about two hours and was a bit stiff. He was obviously not used to the freedom to ask any question he wanted. As I'd worked for the government for about, around government for about 15 years, Pavel considered me a sort of apparatchik and, and also one with unknown powers. Questioning an experienced, well-placed government apparatchik wasn't something anyone did in the former Soviet Union. But after our meeting, I invited him to join me for lunch. Apparatchiks obviously did that. 
So he rather sheepishly accepted my invitation out of politeness. And when I ordered a beer and offered him one, he relaxed noticeably. And he had two beers. And we had found common ground beer. And then we talked for three hours. Now I make this point about beer only because it makes a great illustration of the importance of common ground. Paul and I had found some common ground, and it was something that united us, and it is something that can unite the nation. Among America's diverse peoples and cultures, the common ground of her ideas and values that are founded, which birthed our American nation and our political process, is more important now than ever. If we neglect the common ground of our unity, we risk the division of, of a people, as Abraham Lincoln professed. A house divided against itself cannot stand. But to put this positively, when we do venerate the common ground of our Christian values, we become united in our understanding of righteousness, of goodness, and of justice. And thus we establish the means for ensuring our freedoms among a great and diverse population. What kinds of ideas are swirling around the heads of Americans these days about right and wrong? liberty and justice. What has happened to our common ground? The famous 20th century British economist who shaping, whose uh, thinking shaped the economic policies of most Western nations, John Maynard Keynes, observed, ideas, both when they are right and when they are wrong, are more powerful than is commonly understood. Indeed, the world is ruled by little else. What ideas are we now accustomed to accepting? What can go wrong with them? And what this, and how does this affect our common ground today? Well, one idea comes to mind, and I'll try to break this down, and that's the idea of tolerance. Tolerance, when it's applied to, for example, taste and art, or more seriously, the acceptance of human rights to life and liberty, or to matters of racial and religious non-discrimination, such tolerance is perfectly in tune with Christian truth and values. But sadly, however, tolerance, wrongly applied to the discernment of right and wrong for sexual behavior, for the family, for medical ethics, is not. Such tolerance scoffs at the truth and considers it subjectively discerned in any moral question only a matter of personal choice such tolerance rebels against the existence of a moral absolute. Such tolerance considers narrow-minded and even arrogant the clear truth about ethical questions clarified by our Christian faith and or natural reason, which is rather ironic and somewhat hypocritical attitude if you think about it. Such tolerance is the fomenter of what Pope Benedict XVI calls the dictatorship of relativism. According to Pope Benedict, it is impossible not to notice a self-hatred in the Western world that is strange and can even be considered pathological. It no longer loves itself. Indeed, it sees in its own history only what is blameworthy and destructive and is no longer capable of perceiving what is great and pure. Thus, we no longer venerate our Founders' values or the Constitution that sprung from them, or the political process that protects our personal freedom, self-governance, and rule of law. We are chided, cajoled, and browbeaten to cast away our heritage of Christian values and our collective faith in God away like old newspapers. But without God, who alone constitutes a moral absolute, the minority is subject to the whims of the majority. Without a moral absolute, a sophisticated elite dictates what is politically acceptable. Without a moral absolute, how can a collective conscience about right and wrong be formed? Without a moral absolute, what is to keep justice from becoming arbitrary or capricious? Without God, who or what becomes our moral absolute? What has happened to our common ground? Too many Americans take their United States for granted. At the present time, many African nations are ruled by warlords or dictators. Much of Asia is still under communism, 
Europe, while not communist, is split into an atheistic socialism. We are the last best hope of the world, and yet, some would tell you that the United States separated the institutions of the church and state, and therefore, here comes another wrong idea, no religious moral position is tolerable in our public marketplace of ideas or law. Some would tell you that such moral positions are oppressive or even a form of hate. We are told about the dictates of political correctness or else. Kenneth Howell is an adjunct professor in the religious department at the University of Illinois. But his post is paid for by the local Catholic diocese so the university can remain free and separate from religion. Howell taught a class on the introduction to Catholicism and modern Catholic thought, but was hauled into the department and chairman's office and summarily fired for daring to explain what the Catholic Church teaches about homosexuality. A friend of a student in his class heard about the lecture and emailed a protest to the chair and called Howell's explanation hate speech. The kid emailed it demanding the faculty. They feared the political fallout and were bullied by a single student's opinion. How could this happen? Howell's infraction offended the dictatorship of relativism, but a single student, which embraced and set into motion a politically correct reaction. Such an infraction warranted the suspension of Howell's right to free speech and the abandonment of his right to due process for the job, the property that he owned. He was subject to a politically correct lynching. Now, Professor Howell did eventually get his job back, but you can see what's coming, and it's already here. For the Christian who prays, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Our American political process represents both a serious responsibility and a quickly closing window of opportunity. Given our heavenly mandate to be salt and light to the earth, we have a duty to be good citizens and to stand and to vote for the right side of an issue or an election. But just as important, if we are not vigilant Christian citizens, we are in danger of losing the rights our Constitution affords us to practice our Christian beliefs because they will no longer be tolerated. In a Christian worldview, the Christian worldview and morality are just what the doctor ordered in the world, wandering and wondering what is truth and how should we live. But we have become the minority opinion in a culture that is saturated with wrong ideas concerning truth, justice, and right and wrong. If we do not challenge the constant and continual nitpicking of our history and heritage, the denigration of our Western cultural foundations, the intolerant criticizing of Christian moral values in our American political process. Then we feed the dogs of confusion, cynicism, and apathy, and doom our American identity to obscurity and our nation to anarchy. Therefore, we must exercise our citizenship because it was dearly bought by our grandfathers and fathers, who risked their lives so our country could survive and their children prosper. My grandfather was in Russia during World War I. My father was in World War II at Iwo Jima in Okinawa. My oldest aunt says that my great-grandfather from Liberty City, Ohio, fought on the Union side during the Civil War. I've often wondered what they would say if they could see Americans' attitudes, values, and behavior as they exist today in the country they risked their lives for. My guess is they So in the nattering nabobs of negativism, to borrow a phrase from Vice President Spiro Agnew, bemoan our nation and its history to spew spurious aspersions on the people, on the religion, on the moral values of our founders and on us who still venerate them. Just invite these dissenters to live somewhere else and discover how well their adopted alternative to America tolerates their sin. After they have learned the hard way, they will agree, if they're honest, that our nation, our beliefs in God, our values that derive from those beliefs, 
and our American political process based on those beliefs, in spite of all the human foibles and the weaknesses that afflicted, is still the best place in the world to live. And she will remain so as long as she remains one nation under God. Thank you.